when I was asked to speak, um, they said, well, it was kind of a close first and second between talking about strategic planning and talking about creative organization. And I thought those were two great topics, but they're also things that I do I've actually never really talked about before. So I started thinking about how I could weave them into one presentation and got some of my inspiration from a young leadership Tulsa member who was uh, graduating from his class. And we've started a peer coaching network opportunity to allow um, our class members to continue to work within their cohort on goals. And in asking them to set goals, he said one of his goals was to learn to say no without regret. And I thought, oh my goodness, is that even possible? <laughs> Number one, learn to say no, and then once you do, to do it without regret. And I thought, how topical for so many people, whether you're young in your career like he was, and suddenly where you're working so hard to break through, break through, break through, and suddenly you do, and so many people are wanting part of your time and attention, or whether you're like me and you've been around long enough just to have so many interests and contacts, it's hard to know when to say yes and how to say no. So I hope to do a little bit of both of those today. Thank you in advance to Sarah, who's going to help be my clicker because we were having problems with it up here. So the next thing is, so um, first of all, strategic planning. As I've said, strategic planning is something that I do a lot with organizations, mostly with arts organizations, because there's a lot of great strategic planners in town, and arts is kind of an area of interest for me. And I'm lucky in that if any of you have ever done the Gallup Strengths Finder, one of my talents is actually being strategic. Um, my brain just naturally works in a way that if we're here, where are we? And we want to go there. I naturally sort of see the steps in between and think about what are the possible pitfalls along the way. So um, if you've never done the Gallup Strengths Finder, I actually highly recommend it. It only costs about $15 to do. And it um, tells you wonderful things about how you naturally show up in the world and then give you great um, opportunity to think about how those might be a good match or not such a good match to the situations you find yourself in. So the basic strategic planning process is where are we now, where do we want to go, what are the steps in between, and then I always like to add what are our values along the way because so often I am working with not-for-profit organizations. So the next slide, um, where are we? So you always start with some sort of a current state analysis and there's lots of good tools to do that. Um, <clears throat> one is just looking at your current successes and points of pain as an organization because oftentimes you're either going to want to build on your successes or uh, alleviate points of pain. Many of you have heard about the SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. We actually do a really fun exercise with some of our leadership Tulsa classes at their opening retreats where we look at the SWOT of Tulsa. What are its strengths and weaknesses internal to Tulsa already there? You can do that for your organization. And what are our opportunities or threats? Things that might be in our future or might be affecting us from outside. Appreciative inquiry is another way of doing a current state analysis that really focuses almost exclusively on assets. So it's an asset-based way of uh, looking at where you are. And that's, again, that's something I like about that strengths finder for a personal look at that, is you're looking at what are the assets that you bring to the table, what's special that shows up when you show up. And that can be done for an organization as well, and then build on that. Um, we always need some data and research. Um, this should come from outside the organization, ideally, because it can help us uncover our own blind spots. So for instance, an organization may need to have an understanding of how the demographics of their community are changing. Uh, research from their client base about uh, how well uh, their services are being uh, accepted and perceived. We hear a lot also about outcomes measurement. So it's not just how many people are coming through the door, but how are they changing because of their interaction with your organization. So we do community scans, we do stakeholder surveys, we have lots of ways of figuring out where we are right now. Next slide. So where are we going? We get to identify our goals and objectives. 
Um, one uh, thing, I, a hedgehog principle. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but if you read uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins, thank you, Heidi. I, looked, I knew she'd know what that book was. Good to Great, they also have one for the social sector. It's a little red pamphlet um, that's particularly about nonprofit organizations. It's really about understanding what you do better than anyone else. And this um, became applicable for us at Leadership Tulsa. Um, in a strategic planning process we did about 10 years ago where we had had a very successful youth leadership program for about 13 years and we um, were in a, a group of leadership programs all around the country that had focused on youth leadership development as one of the things they did. Um, but we in the strategic planning process realized that youth programming wasn't our hedgehog. It wasn't the thing we did better than anyone else. We were having to employ an outside contractor who was an expert in youth development. We sometimes had problems staffing that committee. And uh, we determined that actually there were others in the community better able to um, serve youth. And so we worked with Youth Services of Tulsa at that time, who was looking to expand programming uh, in youth leadership. And we just basically shared everything that we had uh, with them. Um, there's another great program I know is still going on. It's called the Youth Philanthropy Initiative. So when people call me now looking for youth program, I try not to be a dead end. But we just decided that adult leadership development was where our hedgehog was. The other challenge I always face when working with groups on strategic planning is you want multiple viewpoints at the table. Um, we know that incorporating diverse viewpoints will make the plan stronger, but you can also get very confused and muddled as many, many different viewpoints are coming your way. So you need processes so that you can make sure you're hearing all voices, but you're also managing them. Um, so that one particularly loud voice doesn't dominate over. So whenever I'm leading a strategic planning process, I really encourage or make sure that we have time where people are doing individual thinking. So the first person who jumps up doesn't kind of get us into a group think where none of us can think about anything different. So taking time to independently process questions is important in those processes. Another thing that is often helpful is once you've done that, have some sort of process where on uh, yellow uh, post-it notes or different color post-it notes, you get the ideas up on the wall so we can all see each other's and then grouping them so you can see where dominant themes begin to emerge. And that doesn't mean if there's a particularly important theme uh, that you might not incorporate it as well. So you're having to choose among numerous good options, and this is particularly true in the nonprofit world, where there are so many things that might appeal to your mission. And I think this is true in our lives, too. You know, there are so many good ways to spend our time. How are we going to choose the best ways to choose our time? And then we try and set SMART goals. So um, I'm not sure if you've heard this before, but SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Agreed to, Realistic, and Time Bound. Um, I had this experience in a very early strategic plan I did when I was director of the Arts and Humanities Council back in, oh goodness, early, mid-1990s, I guess. Um, we ended up with a strategic plan that said we needed to get more publicity and more funding. And boy, for an executive director to act on that plan, it's like, yeah, good idea, more publicity, more funding. You gotta be more specific and measurable than that. And you have to make sure you have a process to meet your goal. So the next slide, what are the steps to get there? You create action plans and task lists. Some people get really super keyed into what's a goal and what's a strategy and what's an action step. I don't care, just get it on paper. So uh, who is assigned to meet the goals? Oh, and if that's your thing, that's fine. In your world, do it your way. <laughs> if being assigned to meet the goals, what are the deadlines? What information do we still need? How do we check in as a group? How will we celebrate when we get there? And so every action plan needs a group that's monitoring it at Leadership Tulsa. Our executive committee revisits our strategic plan. Uh, but I know that I'm a big part of making sure that that stays front and center for the committees as well. We make sure that the goals we set get assigned out to specific committees. 
Um, and we also stay a little bit flexible because sometimes opportunities do present themselves. And then the uh, next slide, we think about our guiding principles. And these uh, create the guardrails we operate under. Um, and I know we do this in the nonprofit world. And I imagine that a lot of businesses have values that they um, put forth as well. And uh, you always know when you walk into an organization um, if people are living their values because you see a consistency across and between different aspects of the company. So these guiding values talk about what is or what is not permissible. So it might have to do with honesty, transparency, values like that, and what is or is not preferable. So um, diversity and inclusion might be a value that we want, if we want to go forward, we want to go forward utilizing diversity and inclusion. And um, so that is my down and dirty. I could talk a whole hour about just these slides, but I'm not going to because I have something that interests me more. And that is how do these same principles of strategic planning show up in our personal lives? You know, there's all the wonderful jokes about, you know, if um, it doesn't matter where you, where you end up, it doesn't matter what path you take to get there. Um, and so in my own life, and I imagine in yours, you have moments where either formally through journaling, which is something I like to do, or just informally in your own brains, you're asking questions like, where am I? You know, where am I on this life journey? Where do I want to be going? And there might be um, things that happen to you along the way that change those answers. And so how do you check in and get that awareness of yourself? Um, it, it, it's, um, it's actually amazing to me how often when I put, I thought it'd be really cool when I was in my 20s to win an award. I had no idea how I'd win an award, but you guys gave me an award, and I thought that was pretty cool. So you guys helped me achieve a life plan without even knowing it. Yeah. I mean, how silly and ambitious, and yet those things, um, you know, they're part of who we are, and in each life era, different kinds of things show up on those lists. Um, what are the steps to get there, and what are my values along the way? And I think that is a super important question, too, and I'm going to share um, some pretty personal stuff about how I answered some of those questions. Um, another thing, if, again, back to the Strengths Finder Gallup poll, not in my top five, but up in my top ten, I have futuristic, which means I can't help thinking about the future. Um, whether it's for my organization, whether it's for myself personally, that's just part of my DNA. I'm always thinking about what the future looks like. And I am married to a guy that never thinks about the future. He only, he lives in the present. And what a great match in a lot of ways because I kind of make sure we're heading somewhere safe and sound and he makes sure we enjoy the moments along the way. So um, all of it is important. So next slide. They also said that it'd be really fun if this could be a little bit interactive. And this may be hard. You may have to do some of this um, outside of this group, too. Uh, some of you may be more uh, tagged into the answers to these questions. Some of you may have to go back and think about them a little more. But the first exercise is I want you to write, and I said three to five statements. Maybe right now one or two would be enough. Um, what is true about you when you are at your very best and it gets to your values. So I had some examples. I believe in people's good intentions. I am passionately persistent. I try to infuse fun into every life circumstance. I am good and kind to all. I treat people respectfully even if I disagree with them. Those are just some examples. So think about, try to come up with a statement or two, eventually maybe more. Who are you when you're at your very best? What do you believe in? What are your values in this world? So I revisit my goals at least every six months. Sometimes things fall off the list. Sometimes things get added to the list. If you've got those, or you've at least got a few thoughts on those, find a neighbor and maybe just share out what you wrote down. <laughs> I 
I just realized if I had been really smart, my presentation would have ended there and I could have let you guys spend the rest of the half hour in conversation with each other and my work here would be done. <laughs> But I do want to share, um, I actually have quite a bit more to share. So next slide. So rather than do this as an exercise, I'm going to suggest that you do this at home. And I did tell Shirley that I would make my slides available so they can be sent out if anyone wants them. But um, so what I would do next, after having that list of three to five goals that I think are important to me, is, OK, so here I am. That's where I want to go. Sometimes they're big goals, sometimes they're small goals. What do I have to do to get there? So I think about the steps. So let me show you how this showed up for golf. So my husband and I have a desire to go to Europe and Great Britain in 2017, right? So that's a big goal. Um, so I started writing out, well, what do I need to do between now and then to get there, right? So the first thing I did is I went and found my passport and discovered it expires in 2017. So the first item on my list was to renew my passport, pretty obvious, right? And that takes several steps, download the form, fill the form out, get the darn photo taken at Walgreens, get it in the mail, sometimes the biggest hurdle of all, but I got that done. Um, we had to decide what countries to go to, and my husband originally wanted to go to like six countries in 15 days, and that was, I knew that would be too crazy, so I got him down to three. So um, you have saved some money, so I set a goal to say put away money every month, and I've hit that most months, not every month. Um, I knew I'd had a couple friends, you know, that whole Facebook envy, fabulous vacation things. The good thing about that is you know who took the trip you want to take. So I reached out to a couple of those friends and who I knew already had visited some of the places, and that was a pleasure to finish that step, because I got to go to lunch with one of my board members. She brought her scrapbooks. Uh, she later sent me some itineraries with actual web links to hotel. And I'll probably still post a query out on Facebook uh, for other people's favorites as I'm. Um, so um, Ralph wants to go back to Paris, because it's sort of like a mecca to him. And then we're going to take that channel thing to London, do some England and some Scotland. We decided to save Ireland and Iceland for another trip. So um, then I had to choose dates that will work well. And so that becomes actually incredibly tricky around work commitments, personal commitments. So I've actually got a block of time now that I think will work. So now it really, so where I am in this process to get there is I'm going to actually have to figure out which locations on which days, right? Actually block out the trip, um, figure out, you know, how to get these plane reservations, these train reservations, um, the hotel reservations, because I'm fine not knowing what I'm going to do, but I have to know where I'm going to sleep. That's kind of like my minimum requirement. So that's where I am. It's like, okay, this is next. Probably ought to start working on it around the first of the year is what I'm thinking. And then I'll have to do some things at work to make sure that things are covered. So that's the process I go through. Um, and it seems obvious. It seems pretty easy, right? Next slide. If it's so easy, because what I just shared was like really darn easy, right? What jams is up? Why don't we accomplish every goal we ever set? And believe me, I do not set every goal I ever set. So, I, so for you all, I thought, well, what jams me up? And maybe these are things that jam you up, too. First one, right off the bat, goals that depend on others, which are not solely in our control. So my first example of this is I got that fabulous little Marie Kondo book, The Magic Art of Tidying Up. <laughs> And I was inspired. I thought, this could change my life. <laughs> well, I quickly realized that once I finished folding my t-shirts and my underwear the special little way, which did make more room in my drawers, so that was exciting, um, that I am not in control of my house. I live with someone. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. And he's a mini hoarder. Not like pathological hoarder, but he's a really sentimental guy. He always thinks something could be useful. So I actually had incredible frustration for about six months when tidying up and finding that magic was on my list. And I finally had to reconcile with myself that I wasn't going to be able to do anything except with those things that were fully under my control. 
Next thing, uh, goals you aren't really committed to in your heart. And for me, I gotta tell you, every single year some sort of weight loss goal ends up on my list. It just does. And you can take one look at me and see that I've not completely accomplished that goal. In fact, it's, I seem to be sliding. But, um, so the challenge there is some of the changes that I would have to make are in direct competition with lifestyle things that I recognize are actually really valuable to me. Um, in fact, I, my husband can't watch this video. Everyone but my husband can watch this video. I said, you know, if we have a, a, a seven deadly sin, I think ours is gluttony, right? We love to eat, drink, and be merry. Um, so, but there are aspects that I have been able to stick to because they've been fun. So I have an exercise buddy in my neighborhood. We used to walk and then when her knee and my ankle started being a problem, we now ride bikes in her sunroom. And we do it four times a week because we have fun together. And so that's something I've stuck to that I'm proud of. Um, for a while, I was doing the 5-2 fast diet, which means you, you basically fast two days a week. You're only supposed to eat like 500 calories. And I stuck to it for a while. I lost about 10 pounds. It was really hard to stick to permanently, but you know what did stick permanently is two days a week my husband and I have salads for dinner. And I think that's something that keeps us just a little bit lighter in the world. So just because I don't always achieve the goal doesn't mean I don't see benefits along the way as I work towards the goal. Um, the next one, shoulds and obligations to others, things that um, someone says you ought to do. Certain types of housework definitely falls on this. My mother dusted every week whether I needed it or not, and my sister, when she comes, is like, oh, and there's that, also the height, you know, if I can't see the top, I never think to dust it. Um, but I probably should, I ought to. Another one that I think is really kind of funny is, uh, uh, pedicures. I actually don't enjoy pedicures. A lot of you just love it. That's what you do to be special. I actually don't find it that pleasant. And um, so, so I, I don't. Uh, I wear close toed shoes though, so we're good. Um, lack of clarity about what we want. For many years, something would end up on my list of I need to find a hobby or I need to find an art form. And that was so amorphous. Um, that when in the last year I started as president of the Board of the Arts Maintenance Council, it was I ought to take a class. That was something I could accomplish. So all of a sudden, what was a very amorphous goal turned into something more specific. I'm going to take a class. And I loved it. And subsequently, I've set up a little painting studio in my basement. So that's kind of fun. I don't know if I found my art form, but I'm exploring it more. And it was that ability to get more specific. Um, we won't accomplish something that doesn't align with our values. And for some of you, you're incredibly competitive. In fact, competitive is one of the uh, themes in Strengths Finder. Some of you just naturally get a charge out of, oh my goodness, we're here and we can, and it's fun and we can compete with each other and I can be the best. I couldn't care less <laughs> if I'm the best. And so anytime you try to gin up excitement with me by making it a competition, I'm out of there. I, I, so, so one of the things, that we have a lot of leadership Tulsa committees that are incredibly competitive. And there's always like, well, we should start a competition among committees. And like, you guys go for it. Um, but it's not something that excites me. So I tend not to accomplish those goals. And then I think the last thing is, so often we're being busy and we are so busy that we get jammed up in really understanding, you know, what would be productive towards the best goals. And I've got some books I'm going to recommend at the end. So I'm going to go kind of quickly through a bunch of things that I found helpful, tools I use. So I'm going to go quickly through all of these uh, personal mission statement, perhaps goals, multiple organization methods I use, saying no, getting help, giving help, and the, I'm going to end with the fourfold way. So first one, personal mission statement. And I'm sharing with something with you um, I've actually never shared publicly. So this is kind of fun. Um, and I can't remember. One of the things about all these things I've adopted over time is I really seldom can remember exactly where they came from. So I don't know if this is a Stephen Covey thing or some book I read. And um, the other thing I'll tell you is that I wrote this in 1997, so that was 20 years ago. And I remembered that I had written this, so I found it to share. 
And um, for some years, I kept it front and center. Honestly, I hadn't looked at it for many years. But I'm hoping that when I read this to you, that those of you who know me would say that when I'm actually at my best, not all the time, obviously, because I'm not always at my best, but when I am at my best, I hope that this is the me that shows up. And it definitely, uh, because I've internalized it, has helped me make choices. So my personal mission statement, I value the people in my life. I am honest, trustworthy, empathetic, positive, and cheerful in my relationships. I could have chosen lots of positive ad adjectives. Those were the ones that were important then, and I, I hope that that's me. I value and nurture my creativity and that of others. And um, again, I've always done better at nurturing other people's creativity. That's why so much of my volunteer work is in the arts, um, trying to do better about nurturing my own. I forgive myself and others for falling short of perfection. And this one was actually pretty huge for, myself, for me. I was always very hard on myself, raised in a, a high performance sort of environment like you might have been. Um, where really not being perfect was pretty much the end of the world or felt like it internally. So how can I forgive myself for falling short of perfection and then giving that same grace to others? And it can create challenges in life as well um, because sometimes, particularly in HR issues, my HR task force chair is in the room, um, holding others to accountable can become difficult for me because I forgive people for falling short of perfection. It's who I am. And yet in a management role, you, sometimes you have to address things. I am truthful with myself and take a proactive approach to life. So and proactivity is, I think that's part of the Stephen Covey thing, but it's very important that you know I can only change what's in my power to change. I can't change what's out there. So I want to be a person who takes proactive role. And I think before speaking of, or acting, I fail at that all the time. <laughs> um, I keep, pro oh, next page. So this is like six things that I pledged to do 20 years ago. I keep promises I make to myself and others. I face challenges with a good attitude, focus, and persistence. And those have been really important to me. And later, again, through this Gallup Strengths Finder, I discovered responsibility happens to be one of my top five strengths. And I don't know if because it was one of my top five strengths already, it showed up here, or because it was here, it's something that I live out. But I do keep my promises. I'll never let you down. Um, I am a student of life. I embrace lifelong learning and new experiences. How 20-year-old of me. Um, <laughs> and. Thank you. <laughs> and then I'm a positive force in my community. I rise up to meet opportunities for leadership and service. And that seems like, well, duh, right? Because you know me, and I've done this for 20 years. And yet at that time in my life, I didn't have opportunities for leadership and service. I hadn't been noticed necessarily yet. Um, but it was on there. And so when those opportunities did arrive, I took them. So I hope that this is the me you see on my best days. And I encourage you to think, go back to those value statements. That's where these play in that first exercise. And begin to think about your personal mission statement. OK, next slide. Perhaps goals. So these are tools I use. I have found this incredibly helpful. And I don't remember what book I read it out of. But sometimes to set a goal creates all this expectancy. And then in me, it creates something I learned is called demand resistance, which as soon as I think somebody else or even myself says I must do it, I really don't want to do it anymore, right? <laughs> so if you're like that, perhaps set perhaps goals. So it's a holding spot for goals that you are considering but not quite ready to commit to. It keeps them on your radar screen, gives, but doesn't give you a sense of failure if you don't accomplish them. And I do use this in both personal and professional contexts. So. Um, at work, I've got this great idea. I'm waiting for time to launch it. It would be called LT Revisited, and it would be an opportunity for alumni to come back and experience some of the class days we're doing now. And I'm hoping that you know we'll be able to launch this maybe even next year. But I have to keep it, perhaps, because there's only limited bandwidth. And we've had other things that we've needed to take care of. Also, uh, I have an idea. Actually, Barbara Bannon helped me think of this one. She doesn't even know it. I think it'd be great to have a peer coaching roundtable for people who are serving as board officers. 
So, you know, all of a sudden you're a treasurer for the first time or you're a board president for the first time. Get together with other people. And again, it's a bandwidth issue. I don't want to lose this idea, but I know I can't really set it as a goal right today. And then in, in personal, I have a, a travel bucket list. Um, I have some goals for my house. I've got lots of things, and I kind of keep them in that perhaps category because I'm not quite ready to do them. Next, I use multiple organization methods. So next, people, so I think people who know me know I get a whole lot done, right? I'm a person who manages to get a ton of stuff done. And the idea of this picture here is not for you to get up there and read my writing. In fact, half the time I can't read my writing. But is this, I always have this next to my uh, phone on my desk, and it's a, just a white notepad where I keep track of the major projects. On the left is, and this is a work-related thing, so a work-related uh, projects. On the right are the class days I'm actively working on planning. So everyone knows I, we do two classes a year and they overlap and no one knows how we do that. Well, this is one way I do it. I have to keep track of how are we doing. This was South Tulsa Day, the retreat, the downtown day, the West Tulsa Day, class 57, info session. And then in that bottom right hand corner are some of my volunteer commitments that I kind of keep on the same page. And anytime I have a, an opening of time, I look at this and say, well, what could I get done in that opening of time? I get to cross things off if you're like me, you like to cross things off. The little check means I've made progress on it, but it's not quite ready to cross off because you know you still need that affirmation you're making progress. Uh, on this particular day, this is just when I was working on the uh, presentation back in September, there were two things that were so long. I had to say C separate list and that was the Paragon Awards which was our big um, event for Leadership Tulsa and um, the Bohemian Ball which in the announcements was kind of a recent and they were a week apart so that was a little crazy um, so I had two separate lists for that next slide so this is so I borrowed and stolen organizational techniques from all over so in the theme of creative organization this is the way I stay organized next slide so people laugh that I still use a real calendar, but I do. And again, you don't need to know specifically what's on the calendar, but I snapped the picture because I have borrowed, it's sort of shades of Franklin Covey, okay, just shades of Franklin Covey. I don't do the whole thing. But what has been helpful to me is on this calendar, everything in the left-hand column are time-related commitments and everything in the right-hand column are tasks I need to get done that week. So if I know that I like to send the agendas out for the class days two weeks before the class day, I go and put on my calendar, send out agenda to class. And it's on there, so when I flip my page and I see my calendar, I remember that that's when I was going to do it. Because part of managing all the projects I manage are not just managing specific projects, but it's also managing things that happen every month every year at certain times. So I, I've not abandoned my physical calendar because it's an essential part of my organization tools. And uh, I didn't have a lot that weekend, and that's just something else I'll say about myself. I'm a natural introvert. I need lots of time to recharge. So people ask you what you did that weekend, and they're expecting you to say something fun. If I said I did nothing, what I'm doing is telling you I did something fun. I did nothing. So you know, I need that time to, uh, uh, to recharge. Okay, next one. So I still use tickler files by month. This was another idea I stole from some organization book. And what's helpful here is um, maybe I've got tickets to an event in December. I can throw them into that file. They're just right next to my desk. If I uh, print out a travel itinerary for a trip that's a couple months away, I can slip it in there. So it's just a really easy way to keep papers organized that I won't need until a specific month. Um, some of you know that at the end of Leadership Tulsa class days, we have people write a note to themselves about what they're going to do because of their experience. And we're supposed to send those out three months later. I put them in the file that's three months later so that I know to pull them out and put stamps on them and send them out. So it's just a really helpful way for me to keep track of things that are time sensitive in a particular month, um, but I don't need to keep you know, front and center. And um, I think, he, so I still use some hard files, obviously. I'm a little older than some of you in the room. I think you could do the same thing with a digital file that you 
name January, February, March, whatever. So if there's something you do every March, but this works for me. Next file, uh, this is really boring. So current files, for me, I use a lot fewer hard files than I used to, like probably like all of you, it's much more digital files. But my current ones are always in a pile on my desk. It looks messy, but it works for me. I always know where they are. And then I have this one little file. Finally, after about 13 years at Leadership Tulsa, I got a new file because the old one was getting so coffee stained and stuff. But it's just sort of my miscellaneous urgent is where I stuff papers that I need to act on. So that's something. Next. Emails and Outlook. Finally, a convert to all of this. But I use a rule that I read in an organization book that was supposed to be about physical mail. So I, I counted for you guys. I get about 150 emails a day. Some of you probably get more, some of you get less. I probably send about 50 emails a day. Some of you probably do more, some of you do less, but that's mine. And I use the rule that I learned for mail, but I use it for email. I try to touch them only once. So I delete. And I say, sorry, bye-bye email newsletters. I don't read a single one of them that you send out women in communication. I don't read them because I'm on my phone and I'm, I can only touch it once, so I delete. Unless I'm in a doctor's office waiting, in which case maybe you get lucky that day. But I don't read them. I'm sorry. Um, I delegate. Sorry, Kindle, who's like, I have two employees, and Kindle's the one I most often de delegate to, but I will forward something immediately on if it's not me that needs to take care of it. I do it right then, so I do keep up with my email, I answer anything I can, and then I do flag for follow up because some things obviously can't be handled right then, and I try to keep my flags where I can see all of them on the right hand side so they're not scrolling down where I can't see them because that's scary. So I try to keep the flag short. So touch it only once. Next one. I say no. Um, don't get push notifications on my phone because if I can't deal with it right then, I don't want to be interrupted in my conversation with you. I do say no to a zillion LT class happy hours. So uh, just this year, I have now been involved with half the Leadership Tulsa classes ever because we doubled up and are doing two a year. And so I always try to go to a few with the current classes that are going on because it's an important part of the bonding. But every once in a while people, well, why don't you join us? It's like I told my board, I need an AA membership if I went to every class happy hour. Um, so, you know, I just, and I'm not an extrovert. Um, I say no to a zillion events that don't directly affect my goals, values, or interests. And I actually think I have an advantage over most of you in this because after working with Leadership Tulsa, where I've probably come into contact with 2,000 individuals through classes and the Get On Board program at Typros and some of the other things I do, I get invited to so many business open houses, holiday parties, um, lots of speaker series. I mean, I just, and so it would be impossible for me to fulfill every invitation. So I think I had to come up with some rules where I don't feel guilty anymore. Just because you ask me and I love you, I may not be able to go. And then I no longer go to events where the only goal would be networking. So I think this is a career specific decision. And if you're in that career building um, point in your life cycle where it's important to see and be seen, then you may make a different decision because it would align with your goals, values, or interests. But for me, I usually show up when there's a purpose. Next. Um, I've tried to say no to being perfect. Housekeeper, family member, boss, etc. Especially housekeeper. Um, I've tried to say no to keeping up with the Joneses, and I love this, saw it on Facebook and snatched it, comparison is the thief of joy, Theodore Roosevelt. And that's hard in this day and age. We see people doing things that, um, gosh, I wish I could do all of it. They've got fabulous relationships, they've got fabulous trips, they, um, you know, they've got the best pets. You know, the cutest kids. I love all of that. You know, uh, you have to be true to your own values. And I always like think about that commercial where the guy's running around on his um, riding lawnmower and he says, I have a beautiful house. I have a beautiful car. I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so what's important to you? And then um, I've said no to other people's expectations of me most of the time anyway, with the exception of my board boss. Yeah. Um, 
so th this pedicures come in there. Okay, so how do I actually say no? And I had to add, add this slide when someone, I was kind of giving them the rundown. They said, okay, but how do you actually say no? So I'm going to give you some of my simple words and phrase, phrases, and some of them I learned from Sharon Gallagher, who had this job before I did. I'm so honored that you asked, but I can't right now. People don't, actually don't need a huge explanation. I'm so honored that you asked, but I can't right now. <laughs> as much as I'd like to, my plate is too full. I'm sorry, I have another commitment that day, or as I was telling my uh, table, and if I ever use this on you, I'm sorry, uh, particularly for personal things on weekends and evenings, I'll just say I have a family commitment. What you don't know is my family commitment is me in my pajamas with my cat on my lap having a glass of wine with my husband, but that is a family commitment. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anyone. It's just our secret. <laughs> I don't think that opportunity is the best match for me. And um, the other thing I've done is um, had to get better about setting boundaries. So if you're a really good volunteer like I am, what will often happen is you'll say yes to this little thing, and then they'll try to make it this thing. And actually Barbara and I did this together. We're helping with a special event fundraiser with, a, with an art auction piece and we're kind of jazzed up about that. That's going to be fun. Someone asked, can you do registration too? And I go, no, we can't do registration too. We can't, right? We did that together. We said no together. And, um, and blaming um, my board is a good one too. You know, my board wants me to focus on this, so I can't do that. Um, so anyway, share your secrets because we all need them. Next one, get help. Uh, so read good self-help books, seek mentors, get professional counseling, and I did do that in my life. Uh, work with a professional coach, I've done that several times in my life, and cultivate a circle of friends, and I love this picture. The circles of women around us weave invisible nets of love that carry us when we're weak and sing with us when we are strong and we all need friends like that. So, next slide. Great books. Early influences that were suggested by my mom that have changed my life. Uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is an oldie, but I swear it's still a really goodie. It changed who I am. And then the next one, it's called Feeling Good, The New Mood Therapy. And it's really about how you can do cognitive psychology on yourself and learn to manage your self-talk better. I'm certainly not perfect, but that book helped me a lot. So that's been good. Next slide. What my therapist made me read. <laughs> so I went when um, my mom was sick and dying and um, thought that that was my issue, but actually it turned out that was just the straw that tipped the camel's back, she spent one hour with me and said, you need to read this book. And I read the book and I said, bingo, too perfect when being in control gets out of control. And it was just an incredibly helpful book. Next slide. A couple recent favorites, Better Than Before, about how we can set good habits and keep them. Lots of good food for thought. And then Deep Work, uh, Rules for Focused Success in a Distracted World. So if you find yourself particularly with technology, but with all sorts of things, just being pulled in a million directions, I suggest Deep Work by Cal Newport. Give help. So I try to be genuinely worthwhile when I show up, and I only show up if I think I can add value, follow through with commitments, or step up into leadership positions. So I don't, I don't serve on boards. I don't get involved in volunteer work unless I really plan to make a difference. And early in my career, one of the things I do is volunteer to be secretary of a board because no one ever wants to do that. But it got me on the executive committee and it was something I could really do easily myself because of my gifts. You have others. Um, I try to mentor, coach, and connect others. I use Facebook and social media for good and not evil, and I'm sure we all plan to do that too, but what does that mean for you? And for me, it means I don't add to the negative energy. I don't complain about things. Um, I don't get riled up. There's a lot of people who do use it as a platform. Um, I like to share cat pictures and <laughs> the nonprofit things that I'm involved with. So um, that's me. Um, and then I'll just close. Um, Actually, I have two more slides, but this one. So all of this organization, all this strategic planning, all this strategic purpose, all this always being focused on goals, 
I use as another set of guidelines um, something that's called the fourfold way. We use it in Leadership Tulsa, and it comes from some writings by Angelus Arian, kind of looking at how archetypes, the warrior, the healer, show up in our world. And so this is the opposite of all that organization planning, but it's really, really important, I think, to being a balanced human person, and that show up and choose to be present. You know, so when you're engaged in a conversation, be engaged in that conversation. Um, pay attention to what has heart and meaning. Speak your truth without blame or judgment, and be open, not attached to outcome. So all of that presentation about the outcomes I'm working towards, you still have to be open to the present. And then the last slide is just one of those great pictures you've probably seen it on Facebook. You know, your strategic purpose is where mission, vocation, profession, and passion align. You love it, the world needs it, you are paid for it, and you are great at it. And I just feel so lucky in my life that I found Leadership Tulsa which is um, part of that strategic purpose for me. So I've enjoyed